So a lot of folks in the studio, we have to kind of prod and get them to tell us what they think, but I don't think that's going to be a problem today. We are joined by <laughs> arguably the most outspoken political animal in South Carolina, Kirkman Finley. Welcome to the studio, man. Man, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, man. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with the, the sort of, the, the game, I mean, this, it, that's a lot going on with the shirt check time. versus the, yeah, I mean, it's a lot going on. Yeah, my wife didn't match me this morning. So, I know. You know. <laughs> shouldn't put the chart out. <laughs> I see you have the Charleston tuxedo well, on. Well, you know, we all do what we do, right? Blazer. And, Gotta uh, have the pink shirt. I'm digging it, man. Yeah. Well, you and I, neither one of us will set any, uh, any no. fashion mm. award We should be on radio. <laughs> <laughs> but we got the beards. So it helps, you know. but not much. Well, let me ask you this. I got to start. You had some health issues recently, and I wanted to just check in how are you doing is it so i go monday mm -hmm. for two years on my thyroid mm -hmm. so i got arthritis in the shoulder was getting an mri two years ago almost two and a half and uh they discovered that i had you know lumps on my thyroid mm -hmm. so had that taken off and everything seems good um after two years assuming i don't have any problems monday you know i'm down to once a year wow. and that will be a uh, that will be a relief. Now you also been gimping around a little bit. Uh, so <laughs> walk us. So you, I noticed you came in today walking like a like a champ. What's going on? So um, probably starting right before COVID, had two surgeries that were uh, misplaced. Didn't really do much. Discovered I had subtalar joint arthritis, which I'm sure will make Tiger Woods feel better to know that we have the same <laughs> condition. Um, had a surgery that involved. Uh, freezing the subtalar joint which is they just basically put a screw in it and it uh it didn't work never completely fused Mo there's a potential it was because of the thyroid cancer right um so they waited till after that and had it redone they had to pull the screw out didn't work put a bunch of bolts in my feet it's uh it's been a lot i mean it i can finally walk but it's still it, it's still i'm I put it to you this way I'm not going to be playing five on five anytime soon. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. After, I mean, everything you've been through with the health, particularly the, the cancer scare, I mean, what makes you want to go back into this political jungle? Well, you feel better. I mean, imagine the feeling of, so your father dies of cancer. And, I mean, I was like, God, this is a death sentence. You know, he died in nine months. So... I mean, I feel blessed. I mean, yeah, my foot hurts a little bit, but compared to where I was, it is like being released from prison. So you feel better. There's a lot to do still. I mean, you have physical therapy, got to take some extra medicine, but, man, I'm, I feel better. I feel energized, and I'm watching. And my question becomes as I look around Columbia – we're building new buildings, but I drove out here on UG Street. And it's funny. I was talking to a friend, and we're driving down. I said, well, that building, the old Cogdell building, 40 years old. The F-Light building that was the AT&T, maybe still is, 35, 30. We're a community that's not growing compared to the rest of our state. Lexington's exploded. I mean, God, I Charleston, remember. Charleston, Greenville, Bluffton. Yeah. Well, I yeah. remember when we were 15 and we'd go to the lake. I mean, you there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. In 40 years, it's changed so dramatically. And I have to step back and wonder, why hasn't Columbia? And in addition, I wonder, you know, I've got three daughters, 24, 22, and 20, soon to turn 21. Are they going to come back here and live here? I mean, is it dynamic? Is it fun? I don't know, but I think we've got a chance to make it that way, and we better do it. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you this because you talk about Columbia, and I want to get into your your roots here. Oh, yeah. You've been here a long time, and you yeah. mentioned yeah. your father earlier, though. But I want to talk about that because, you know, for those who don't know, your dad was mayor of Columbia, Correct. a longtime mayor of Columbia. In fact, inspired you. You were a councilman in yep. Columbia. You served on the city council for several years, uh, going as far back as you do here in Columbia and that kind of commitment to this community, what are the things you talk about it needs to change, it has to change? What are some of the things that, it, that need to change for Columbia to reach that potential that it's not reaching now? Well, I mean, first of all, we have to say 
and look at the numbers. If you looked at the city of Columbia census, the size of Columbia hadn't changed much in 10 years, 15 years. We need to ask why. I mean, we, we need to understand that it is a problem that we're not growing. For example, Richland County lost a House membership or a House seat in the last reapportionment because the rest of the state is growing and growing so much more quickly than us. We lost a Senate seat, too. Lost the Carpoolian a Senate seat. seat got drawn off the map. So think about it like this. The, the counties that are losing seats you know, are small rural counties. The counties that are gaining seats, Ori, Spartanburg, Greenville, you know, Berkeley, Charleston, Hilton Head. I mean, Hilton Head's not a count for, but yeah, Buford. Buford. Yeah, Bluffton. And, Bluffton. And, yeah. So those areas are, are gaining political power. Lexington. We're atrophying it. That can't be construed, in my opinion, as anything other than a problem. So let's ask the question. 30 or 40 years ago, we were considered the most important or the second most important city in the state. That's probably not as clear today. So the question is, I don't really hear people comparing us to Charleston much anymore. But that's fair. The ocean doesn't touch Richland County. But compared to Greenville, it's a very different feel than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And this has been, unfortunately, a problem for our city every 30 or 40 years. I mean, originally it was Atlanta we were competing against, then Charlotte, then, you know, Charleston, Greenville. The question becomes, at what point do we, are we competing with Florence? I mean, we need to ask ourselves, how do we get out of this loop? Yeah. Well, and obviously the governor of South Carolina, Henry McMaster, is from Columbia. But as you know, Correct. having spent time in the legislature, the, the governor's basically a freshman backbencher in the House in terms of power. The legislature is where the power is. The legislature yeah, is where the power is. But his that... base isn't Columbia. Yeah. yeah. I mean, let's be honest. To some degree, if you are a strong Republican governor, and Henry is a strong Republican governor, you're drawing your power not from Richland County. You're drawing it from Lexington and Kershaw and Greenville and Spartanburg. And again, just like we're atrophying people, businesses, we're atrophying political power. So who is Columbia's voice right now in the legislature to try and restore that balance? Well, let me put it to you this way. Let's, let's think about it like this. In 1986, when my dad, I think, was mayor for the last time, if Lexington Medical had wanted something to the detriment of Richland Memorial, he would have gotten an MG2, you know, the old Crown Vic, municipal government too, and driven straight down Main Street to the General Assembly. And they would have thumped the Lexington, you know, Republicans back across the river. Today, it's 180 degrees different. Mm -hmm. No one... I mean, every constitutional office except one, which was appointed by Henry, which is odd, are Republican. Every elected official in our state is Republican. Both senators, U.S. senators, what, six out of seven members of Congress. So we're out of step with the rest of our state. And it shows in our ability to gain power and influence in the General Assembly, which unfortunately for Columbia— because of USC, the fort, city, county, state, federal government, and hospitals is incredibly important. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you about one of the issues that plagues Columbia and the, the crime issue. And I wanted yep. to bring this up because folks who have followed Fitz News know that we've been very aggressive on judicial reform. They know that we have been carrying this torch for several years. We've been really putting pressure on lawmakers. But what a lot of folks don't know you're the guy that first educated Sad. me that this yep. was a problem. And it was a case in your district back in right. 2013, the story of Kelly Honeywell. You remember this story? I do. Judge let her, let her kill her out much earlier than he should have been. Never should have been on the street. And if you were to ask 
law enforcement in a quiet moment away from a camera, I think you'd discover that many of the people who terrorize our community are the same group. It's not a wide group. It's a very narrow group. And that group is caught frequently for the same infractions over and over again and is never really put in jail, certainly not for the extended period of time that they could be. So, for example, if you get caught possession of a firearm, certainly by the second offense, you can be put in jail for a year. Judge needs to decide to do it. Mm -hmm. And there is enormous pressure not to. From the Todd Rutherfords of the world, from the trial lawyers? Or from... Just enormous pressure. I mean, it's, it's, it's wide-ranging. Mm -hmm. So my question is, it's wide-ranging, but it's not deep. Let me make sure. I don't want anybody to be confused. I'm not saying that 60% of the voters in South Carolina want repeat gun offenders on the street. What I'm saying is that a segment of the political structure does not want them put in jail for whatever reason. You take those guys off the street, many of whom are young, you do two things. Number one, you help that, that issue in South Carolina. In other words, violence, and especially violent crime. There are entire neighborhoods that you help. Mm -hmm. But number two, you give those guys a chance to turn their life around. They're not doing it now. Mm -hmm. We got to go out and deal with it. We've got to, when we catch them, put them in jail and keep them there. And judges have to be willing occasionally to hand down the maximum sentence. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because one, one of the things that you challenged me on, um, and again, I, I got to blame you. You're the one that turned me on to this whole issue. But one of the things you've challenged me on is, is as we debate these various reforms, popular election, gubernatorial appointment, some sort of hybrid, or just tweaking the legislature's current selection method. One of the things you've always challenged me on has been, do I really care about the process or do I care that the outcomes are fixed? And you pointed to a few outcomes just recently. Obviously, yep. Bentley Price getting thrown off was one of them, but there yes. were others. Yeah. I mean, somebody, former legislature running, who was coasting until all of a sudden somebody basically said, what are we doing here? This is James Smith, the former House Minority Leader, former Democratic gubernatorial nominee. Your, word, your words, not mine, but... Um, <laughs> And, and he, was, this, he was a lock. He was yeah, a shoe in your yeah, right. And this candidate, as stuff started to come in, up was told, get out. Get out. Do not. And the General Assembly voted no. That is the most important thing that people come to me. We need three, you know, a different selection committee. Okay. We do. Great. We need the governor to put some people forward. We need the, the, the committee made up of this. Great. But my point is this, the General Assembly, and specifically the House, because we have 124 versus 46, are in the unique position to say no to bad judges. And our job ought to be to cull it. It ought to look like a movie cutting room floor. And after a while, people who are not competent, people who are disrespectful to their employees, women, some of these judges that we've seen will quit coming up. They will quit putting their name up because they do not want the experience of being told no publicly. Well, and that's what happened to James Smith. And I wanted to ask you about this. Obviously, Heather Bauer, uh, your opponent this fall, uh, sounded you know, the alarm on judicial reform, was making a lot of waves on it, introduced some legislation. But when it came time to actually cast that vote for James Smith. She was on the wrong side of that vote. Am I correct? I mean, yeah. And the bigger question is, what criteria would have ever gotten you there? It's the same reason that I will not vote for family members of members of the General Assembly to be a judge. It, it there are, there are 170 of us. Your wife or husband needs to wait till you're out of office, and there needs to be a prohibition for a period of time. 
it does not need to look like a political hookup. Mm-hmm. That's, if, if we treat judges as political plums to be handed out, we are going to get a political plum outcome, which means if you, are, if you get there by favors, when somebody calls those favors in, the judicial process has had a thumb put on it. That's not what we need. We need people who call balls and strikes. Let me tell you a story. Going back to one of the people you made reference to, one of the judges, um, after that event, we were sitting down and talking, and a member of the General Assembly, who is a lawyer from the upstate, said, I'm going to go meet with this judge, but I'm scared I'm going to get out legaled. Hmm. You know, I'd just like you to come listen. The judge looked at me, and I said, well, this is the law as I understand it. And she said, it is, but I don't agree with it, so I don't enforce it. Judges are supposed to call balls and strikes. They are like the umpire. They are not out there to create the rules of baseball. They're out there to call balls and strikes. That's where we've gotten in trouble. We have judges who want to be legislators. If they want to be a legislator, run for the legislature. I've heard some interesting stories, too, about you pulling some of these candidates aside uh, and reading them the riot act about calling balls and strikes before you go to work for them on the floor. Because as you said, the House, 124 can't. votes, you can't win a judgeship without the House. Right. So we uh, we had somebody a couple of years ago whose uh, father and I are, after many years, really good friends. But his father might have uh, had different views of judicial <laughs> reform or the way judiciary should work than I do. And uh, he was up there, same guy pulled out for the other one. Didn't want to say anything inappropriate, wanted to make sure. And I just said, look, if you are going to play this favor game, I don't want you as a judge, and I'm going to go work against you. But if you tell me right now you are going to call balls and strikes, you are going to stay in your judicial lane, I'm going to go work for you. But you have got to make it abundantly clear to me and my fellow legislators, that you are not here trying to play the, the game that some of the other, other judges you've mentioned were playing. Let me ask you, and I want to move off judicial yep. reform because we've got a ton of stuff to cover. Yep. But I do want to ask you one last question about it. Um, as you look at what happened this past legislative session, whether it was the defeat of James Smith or Bentley Price getting thrown off the bench, do those things matter more as far as long-term impacts on the process or does the bill that passed reforming the Judicial Merit Selection Commission uh, uh, sort of minutia, does that – which one of those things? And, again, it's not wholly unsubstantive reforms. They did some things to that judicial reform panel. But Look, I'm, in, I'm fine with what they did, but I think the, the bill that they passed, fine with it. But that is a secondary solution, the primary First, most important solution is to vote no. When you get to the floor, you should not be an automatic lock, even if you're by yourself. So if there's a judge that something comes out and we discover something horrible in your background, you should be voted no. If a group of legislators say, this person views the law very differently than we do, just because they got through judicial merit screening or were the only candidate that applied or are coming back up because they've been there for 20 years, say no. Yeah. I promise you saying no will do more to clean it up. I mean, getting rid of judges, sitting judges, the other judges start paying attention because they realize that their job could be on the line too. I want to ask you this. We've got a state budget that's going over $40 billion. Yep. And you count in all the federal, the other funds, the, the general funds. You've got South Carolina with the third worst labor participation rate in America, some of the lowest income levels in the entire country. We keep seeing this escalating investment in government without the returns economically. Let me ask you this. You, you've been a very strong proponent for, for tax relief. You've argued to send right. that $1.8 billion 
the lawmakers found back to the taxpayers. It's all of a sudden been forgotten. I mean, <laughs> we just disappeared. Woo! Tell me how that happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there. You look at tax policy, though, uh, not just for Columbia, but for right. the entire state. What do we need to do on taxes to get more competitive? Well, first of all, we need to continue cutting our state tax rate. It matters. Secondly, we need to, f- and, and people go, oh, you're going to cut. The-. Tear it in over time and start cutting. Number two, in order for us truly to control our spending, we're going to have to get our pensions under control. We need to make sure we understand how deeply we are in the hole. Because if you don't fund your pensions, guess what? It's a tax just on a future generation. And then the final thing we need to do is to decide what are we investing in. Roads, absolutely. Telecoms, great, if it's something that we can't get privately. Water and sewer, 100%. Primary education, yes. Should South Carolinians have an opportunity to go to state schools? Yes. But there is a lot of stuff that we get way off mission on. And when I say off mission, it's stuff that's or spending that is no longer important, it's no longer pertinent, or it's not the purview of government. So, Kurtman, on education, we've got to give your opponent a little bit of credit, right? She took after Richland County School District 1 for— And achieved what? Oh, for— She had a press conference, made a stink, nothing changed, and she came up with no solutions to the problems. So so what's your education solution? Uh, The choice. I mean, let's put some competition. Let's make it where parents have every available option for their children. Some children need completely different than others. Look, Gray's Academy out here, people that want to pursue athletics. Is that wrong? No, it's fine. You know, you have private schools, public schools, parochial schools, home schools, magnet schools. Let parents choose for their children what they want. I think as you bring more choice, the school board will have to compete. What would I love to see is a couple of schools that were, I mean, so good that they attracted students from other counties. You know, great uh, AP, you know, and uh, IB programs that were just great. What we need is that belief that we can make our community better through education. We want our communities to be educated, but the school board, we are not going to get them to accept that by attacking them. We're just not. We need to realize that competition and changing the rules will force them to swim harder than they have been now. So, Kurtman, you were talking earlier about that one Democrat who's holding the statewide office right now, the (laughs) Comptroller General appointed by Governor McMaster. But you were in line to to receive that. Not in line. I I lined up the votes. You had the votes. It Mm -hmm. was seemingly a done deal that you would be— Had been asked by the Speaker to take it on. Yes. Right. But you were perceived as the front runner for that position. What what happened with that Comptroller gig? I would tell you that members of the Senate— were afraid of accountability and what an audit might show. I mean, if, from what I've heard, have you heard anything about the billion eight? I think everybody's planning to go back to, you know, nobody here but just us chickens. (laughs) They knew what I was going to do, which is we were going to bring sunshine and clean it up. Do I know there's a problem? No, but it has all the hallmarks. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody knows. Previous guy leaves in disgrace. We've got a candidate. Remember now, certain senators were pushing their man. They were trying to cut a deal to get their guy in charge. Now, do you think they were pushing their guy because he was going to clean it up or keep a lid on it? Look, one senator point blank told the uh, chairman of Ways and Means that I was going to blow it up. And that is exactly correct. I mean, think what we could do with a billion eight. We could give it back to the taxpayers. We could finish, you know, malfunction junction. Yeah. I mean, that money alone would take care of malfunction junction. Redo state buildings that have been chronically underfunded. Mm -hmm. I mean, I bet in rural South Carolina, there are a hundred communities that need a new ambulance. 
I mean, you know, when you live in Nowhereville, one ambulance that's working is without, at times, a death sentence. Yeah, one of our researchers just interviewed the sheriff of um, Hampton County whose vehicle has 371,000 miles Yeah, it's crazy. It. They can't, yeah. It's crazy. So, you know, w- which would I rather have? Sheriff's departments in rural South Carolina fully staffed. You know, ambulances able to serve. You know, people able to get basic functions or stuck in some investment fund somewhere nebulously, I think the people deserve better than what they've gotten. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you about this. You, We saw just this past week the uh, Democratic nominee, mm-hmm. Kamala Harris. Obviously, that's a different nominee than the one that received all the delegates on, yeah. the, on the way <laughs> yeah. to the convention. We won't get into that. We won't put our tinfoil hats on on that one for this segment. But... Uh, Named her vice presidential nominee, the governor of Minnesota. And I wanted to raise this issue because you got absolutely hammered on the abortion issue uh, during the last race. Yep. Just absolutely beaten up on it. Not very honestly either. They're kind of misrepresenting your position. But the position of the governor of Minnesota, the new Democratic vice presidential nominee, is that abortion from zero weeks to 40 weeks, from conception to nine months, is on the table. And you were telling me just before we came on that there's a new article out in the Wall Street Journal. Today. Yeah, that points to, what was it? 22 weeks. Yeah, viability at at 22 weeks. That's a huge disconnect, isn't it? Look, so what you're saying to me, and perhaps I'm approaching this, you know, without thought or, you know, sensitivity or whatever, is what you're saying is that your placement inside the mother or outside the mother is the only thing that determines whether you have rights as a child. I mean, in my opinion, a drunk driver goes through a stoplight and hits a mother who is 24 weeks pregnant, kills the mother and the child, that's double homicide. If he kills the child and not the mother, that's homicide. I mean, it's just, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. So how, I struggle to understand how that changes. If you're viable, if if you were able to have a C-section at 24 weeks, let's say, and the child was able to live, what do you do? How do you then say, oh, no, that's not a, a human? I mean, I, I don't know. I, it, it's very interesting to me because I watch the disregard because it, it is disregard, and it's, it's uncomfortable. It's hard to explain how that logical connect just gets avoided. Yeah. I mean— if your grandparents get old, at are you able to say at the age of 90, we just put a bag over their head? I mean, what are we doing here? So it's it, – it, my theory has always been that I would rather give people who haven't been born a chance as opposed to those who have been born and committed horrible crimes. So – I would say that, yes, I'm for the death penalty in certain circumstances, clearly. I mean, if you, you know, if you go do horrible stuff, especially stuff that involves children, yeah, you deserve the death penalty because I don't know what else I can do to stop you. So why are we putting our energy into anything other than the protect, protecting the most vulnerable? Look. One of the news stories this week has been about someone that we know and that may have violated children's rights or children. There's no excuse. If that is the case, I'm not judging. I'm saying, but if that is for real, dig a hole and put him there because we have got to protect children. 
So for me, it's a much more logical but also big spectrum point. We need to protect the vulnerable at both ends. We need to decide with rational health care where those problems are. You and I had a friend who a year and a half ago had a horrible accident. After a couple of weeks, they realized that there was nothing left, right? Pull the plug and he died immediately. So that's us being thoughtful, not comfortable. Nobody likes it. But that's very different than making that decision for somebody who's never lived and has never been sick. I, I, I just don't understand the, the, the equilibrium here. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. On the, you did vote for heartbeat, yep. obviously. Uh, is your point now or is, is viability sort of the— My point is that with heartbeat— I guess where would you draw the line is what I'm asking. I would draw the line that we don't need to do anything beyond what we've done today. I mean, the heartbeat. Yeah. I didn't vote for the last bill. I thought there were some real issues with what we had decided about some of the reasons that you could abort a pregnancy. Because mm -hmm. I don't think they were particularly well documented or understood medically. I'm not trying to limit it. What I am trying to say is that is a very, very important medical understanding. We never got there. But this thing has become a political hot potato because we're arguing about stuff that doesn't make sense to me anymore. On an emotional level, a fetus that has a heartbeat. Okay? So if you're arguing the other side, I can tell you that at 22 weeks, the child lives outside the womb. Looks to me like there's 16 weeks. Heartbeat? What's the next stage? I don't know. But I know this. A heartbeat is a heartbeat. I mean, it signals brain activity. It signals other activity. Does it mean that they can live outside the woman's body? Absolutely not. But it is certainly a different—it's no longer two cells. Right. You've watched a little of the Olympics, I'm yep. presuming. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you this. I Watching some of these— uh, the women's boxing in particular is it even women's boxing anymore i don't know but we talked right. about uh wrote about this on our site looking at some of the first of all the olympics the opening right. ceremony with the crazy uh you know drag queens in the last supper and then now we've got these uh xy two xy uh boxers participating as women and kurtman this is not just happening over in paris as this is happening we've got a massive uh court battle including uh, several cases which involve South Carolina over Title IX, over right. uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris attempting to rewrite Title IX to reclassify gender identity as, as gender, which, you know, the last time I checked, that discriminates against right. female competitors. But this whole woke uh, vanguard of woke thought we're dealing with, uh, your opponent has really embraced a lot of these things. Let me let me ask you this though: If you're a citizen of Columbia, South Carolina, if you're worried about the trains, if you're worried about the economy, if you're worried about that lack of of growth that we're talking right. about, uh, how does standing up for two guy boxers <laughs> fighting in the women's division in the Olympics? Why is that on on the Democrats' radar to the extent it is? You would have to ask them because I have no <laughs> idea. I mean. Think about what it says to a whole generation of feminists. Mm. I mean, people that for years fought for equality to then have, we know there's a problem. Because you remember in the 70s and 80s in the Olympics, the, you know, East Germans would always get thrown out for using enhancement devices, right? You would know that Lance Armstrong, 
got tossed for using enhancements, right? They biologically enhance their ability to perform. This is that on a different level. 13, 14 year old boys, by the time they hit maturity, I mean puberty, develop lungs and muscular structures that are completely different. It is biological. That is not to say that all boys are stronger than all women, but when you get to the top echelons in most sports, doesn't matter in riding, doesn't matter in some other ones, but in those types of competitive sports like boxing, it didn't even, I mean, it's for someone to say, I box my whole life and I've never been hit that hard, I'm out. Yeah. What does it tell you? Well, you go back two years ago, the, the, uh, Penn Swimmer, University of yep. Pennsylvania oh, yeah. Swimmer, was number 462 yep. in the country when competing as a man. As a male, then identifies as a woman, and all of a sudden is the national champion. And don't forget that. There's somebody else who get kick, get, gets kicked off the team that loses their spot that they worked their whole life for. So I don't understand if there were a lot of women trying to compete in men's sports – and a lot of men trying to compete in women's sports. And it was even roughly, you know, equal. I would say, okay, we have a problem. This all appears to me to be gender males trying to identify as females. Are they taking advantage of a marketplace? It feels that way. I mean, how about we just rewrite the rules that the only people that can compete in women's sports are women, biological women, and everybody else competes in a free-for-all. Hell, if we want to have a third group, we can have a middle group. I mean, Greek has, you know, singular, plural, and middle. Oh, dual. So you have two people, dual. So have a group that is, you know, like an open group. So you're a guy that doesn't hold back on expressing opinions you're a guy who doesn't <laughs> hold back on telling people exactly what you think correct uh, yeah, your colleagues in the yep. legislature have been very clear yeah that you you're the most blunt guy they've they've ever worked with i want to ask you this though because you tell people the truth whether they like it whether they don't like it but uh there was recently a story in the state newspaper and i was shocked to see this because the yep. state newspaper i don't know if you you know it's uh not really hard on Democrats the way it is. You're telling me right? Tucker Carlson isn't the, in the editorial. <laughs> right, right. He's not, okay, yeah, no, no, no. It. He's not leading the editorials. But it's a paper that has historically veered to the left on ideology. It's veered to the left politically. Uh, and I was surprised to see them come out with a very aggressive article calling out your opponent, Heather Bauer, for basically lying on some mail pieces. And not just lying, but lying about giving – residents a tax cut they never got uh let me ask you this though is as you look at your bluntness your honesty a lot of folks will say oh well he rubs rubs me the wrong way or whatever but to you is it more important to be honest or to be popular and let me ask you this were you surprised to see for once uh that paper calling out your opponent for her lack of honesty i mean i was stunned um, but I think it was a trend that if Joe would do once a week would help politicians in general. We, we need to be, it needs to be a little less gotcha and it needs to be a lot more factual. Pointing out factual inaccuracies matter. I mean, a billion eight unaccounted for is what I would call the big whopper of factual inaccur inaccuracies, right? Because where do you put that on your audit? We got a billion. Yeah, I mean, is that a footnote? Is that a sort of a question mark? And our unwillingness to address it is the problem. So, yeah, my comment would be taking credit for stuff you haven't done is terrible. I mean, it's why do it? Why get involved? Why tell the voters that they're getting a tax cut when you ha aren't? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. I mean, not what I would try to do. Yeah. As you look at this upcoming election, obviously there's going to be a ton of these issues that are at play. Yep. 
to you, what's the one that's going to be driving your message? What are you going to focus on as far as what, somebody can make, up, somebody who can make Columbia the best? Yeah. Who can you got to have a dissenting voice? You got to have somebody who can go work with leadership to make the state appear. Columbia needs to realize that there are bigger fish to fry locally. I would tell you that I think abortion and abortion law in South Carolina is settled. And by the way, it was settled when I wasn't there. So to be clear, my opponent lost on her primary issue. She did not put up 500 amendments, install the process for four days, like I think she threatened to do. She did not lay down in front of the train. She lost. So how is she going to impact the outcome on that issue at this level ever again? I would argue that the next bill that comes up is total abortion ban. How is she going to impact that? They've already ignored her once. I'm not going to vote for a total ban. She, she and I would have, you, me, and her will have the exact same impact on that discussion. And by the way, I don't think you're running for office, do you? <laughs> no. so, so the point is anybody who is casting about in this election and abortion is the litmus test. That it, You're not getting anything. That ship has sailed. That and, ship has sailed. It's over. It's done. Yeah. The only thing that you might get is worse from your perspective if you are an advocate of abortion. Yeah. It could probably get worse. I'm not going to vote for it. But he, neither Heather nor I will be the vote that stops it. That's true. So the question becomes, if you can't impact that, I mean, well, you got a better chance of hitting the moon with a rock. Let's move on to issues that matter. Mm-hmm. You know, the judiciary is going to become more conservative. It just is. There are more conservatives voting. In the House, getting money out of the budget I clearly know more about that than she does. Mm -hmm. I mean, I find it interesting that we were able to get $5 million for Columbia um, for railroad tracks. I mean, that is a—and that's what's so important. It's a Columbia issue. It is a statewide issue. It doesn't benefit just one person. That's what my focus on is making Columbia the Midlands, our region, where we live better and stronger. I mean, I helped Nathan and those guys work on the path, the trail, because it matters. We're an interconnected community. We don't live on an island. House District 75 does not survive without the rest of the city and the rest of the state. And by the way, I do also want to point out that while you are a blunt individual, you're also very available to folks. And I think you brought, did you bring this flip? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I keep hearing it. Well, we got to flip it, man. Oh, man, no, no, no. It, the flipping like, is cool, but that's the sound you like. <laughs> that's the 1990s technology. Oh, n- no, 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 no. <laughs> Mid 2000s. Okay. Early, early 2005, <laughs> 8. You give yourself a little credit there. Yeah, man. I mean, no. come on, baby. I, I mean, I, did, I never had one of those. What were the ones you wrote on? The uh, palm? Never yeah, did. The that. trios or whatever. Yeah, I like the Blackberry. There you go. T- funny story. Um, we had a uh, friend who passed away about 14. 13 months ago, and he, he, like I, was an advocate of the BlackBerry. So they're trying to get all the pictures off his BlackBerry, and I get this call, hey, do you have an old BlackBerry? I'm like, of course I do. And they're like, well, we can't, his battery won't work. Can we have your battery? I'm like, sure, but don't bury him with it. And so got all the pictures off of it. All's good. I mean, within the confines of it could be, but I'm ready to go back to BlackBerry. Well, I hope for the sake of the folks in Columbia, you're yep. ready to go back. To that I state am. house, Kirkman, because uh, it's one of those, uh, like you said, the city has not had a voice there for some time. And, you know, you hate to say it, but look at who is advocating to help me, the speaker, the chairman of Ways and Means. One of the high-ranking Democrats at lunch on Monday told me, he goes, Kirkman, you got more reach into Ways and Means today than any of us do. And he serves on the committee. I mean, it's what are you willing to do? 
So we're going to see make Columbia great again hats anytime soon. You know, I was thinking about <laughs> it, but um, you got to, your hair's too good. For yeah, that. no, no, you no. I like, me, hey, well, yeah, but maybe I could get it on tinfoil. Got to get the tinfoil. Yeah, no, but it's <laughs> we're at a point where we got to decide as a city where we want to go. And I think where we want to go is a city that's livable, comfortable, safe, and with great education. USC is getting better. How do we make the rest of the city better? We got some challenges. I mean, the weather's occasionally a little rough, as we see. But how do we do that? Yeah, a lot of ways. So how about you? You going to have any more kids? <laughs> oh, man. Hey, Come I'm on, baby. I'm the one asking the question. Oh, no, 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 no. Come on, Will. We got to turn the spotlight oh, around. Oh, no. Hey, man, I'm going where I'm told. You know, yeah. although the uh, the attorney general did tell me not long ago that, you know, if I felt like I was the victim of um, – of, of of sex slavery, I could I could reach out to him and uh, get some <laughs> yeah, relief. Yeah. No. Well, well, did you tell him it wasn't just sex? <laughs> yeah, 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 you just do as you're told all day long. <laughs> that is the that's the story of my life, man. But you know what? I uh, happy life, uh, happy wife, happy uh, life. That's how how long we've been? We've known each other for what twenty years now, twenty five. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been, you know, what we see now, at least in my opinion, is a group of people operating on snippets of information that aren't focused on the big picture. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen it like this before. Yeah. But I guess that's where we are. Nobody nobody likes the facts. They all like the statement, the political, you know, angst. Yeah. It's weird. It's weird. Well, we don't tell each other the truth anymore. I think that's part of the problem. You know, we there are times I'll say things that get people's uh, lather up, uh, you know, and they'll... You know, block or cancel or you know we all shut shut down things we don't want to hear but uh I let's, think let's take a real easy one south carolina's growing right leaps and bounds and it's people moving out of states that are traditionally blue moving to a traditional red state right so what it means is in the competition for population we're doing a good job yeah if you want somebody who understands how to make our state better and appeal to others, I'm that person. If you want somebody who understands how to bring that state, that blue state mentality that is driving people out to our state, she's that person. I mean, it's that simple. It's what do you believe in? What are you incentivizing? That's what you're going to get. Absolutely. Yeah, and bad news. The rest of the state is not going to in incentivize Columbia's fantasies of being deep blue in a red state. They may tolerate it. They may laugh about it, but they aren't going to pay for it. And if you don't have that money, where is it coming from? The feds aren't going to pay for it. Tim Scott, Lindsey, the six other Republicans, they aren't. That, it's a very interesting approach. Well, Kurtman, man, I appreciate you coming down. I appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely, man. And uh, obviously, this mic always on, always open for you. We love the blunt takes, man. <laughs> well, I'm Keep them coming. Yeah. Kurtman Finley, everybody, let's get you back in soon before this election. Thanks, sir.